Welcome to Conversations. I'm Muhtadar Khan, your host, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the competition, the global geopolitical competition uh, in the arena of scientific research. Uh, today I saw this article in The Economist. Uh, lots of people are discussing it on X uh, and talking about what it means for the global order, what it means for the United States hegemony, and what it says about the rise of China. So this article published in The Economist uh, on June 12th, uh, just about three days ago, essentially says China has become a scientific superpower. From plant biology to superconductor physics, the country is at the cutting edge. So obviously you can imagine uh, how provocative the title is. And so I, I took a look at it, and I think it's it's both fascinating as well as troubling for those who are worried about the rise of China and its power and what it means uh, to their own country, uh, your own country's independence, uh, especially if you are in the Asia-Pacific region, in the Indo-Pacific region, the rise of China as a military power, as a big economy, and now as also uh, on the cutting edge of science. Uh, and, you know, uh, at the G7 uh, this weekend, there one of the concerns was uh, about uh, the growing impact and significance of artificial intelligence. And so along with artificial intelligence and scientific progress, uh, a thing that goes along with it is military power. So the country that is on the cutting edge of scientific research will uh, also become a major power. So in that context, I want to not just look at this article, but I also looked at some of the UNESCO data and other uh, listings, which sort of give you a, an idea of the changing balance of power in the arena of scientific research. But before that, please subscribe to Conversations, uh, uh, press the bell icon so you get notifications of new videos, uh, like this video, and don't forget to share with it, especially if you are in the academia or scientific field, it's important for you to share this video with your colleagues. So how does the economics conclude that uh, China has become a rising superpower? Uh, basically, it looks at publications and scientific research. So one of the main indicators that it uses is the nature index. And if you look at this particular graph, it shows the number of thousands of publications from the country of origin in top journals. So you look, the Nature Index looks at the top journals in all scientific fields, uh, and then looks at the number of articles which are there in that, in these prestigious journals which are peer reviewed, and it's impossible to do that. Uh, I mean, it's some some journals, uh, the acceptance rate is like one in a thousand. So getting into some of these top journals is really very tough. Uh, and so if you look at uh, the data that we have here from 2015 to 2023, the data, uh, the, the point, the year 2019 is critical. It seems that the economists did a survey in 2019 and concluded that China will soon become a scientific superpower because it was really on par with the European Union in 2019 and much behind the US. But if you look at the data now, if you're looking at 2023, China has surpassed the US in terms of total publications according to the Nature Index. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the US not only has fallen behind China. But if you look at China's graph, it is a steady and steep climb, whereas the United States is stagnant. And in fact, since 2021, it's a bit on decline, even though the US did spend a lot of money uh, post-COVID on research, uh, it is disappointing to see that decline there. And of course, the European Union has been stagnant for the last 10 years. Uh, I'm surprised that it is stagnant and it has not declined. Uh, so this is one indication in terms of the sheer volume of scientific, of high quality scientific research that is being produced. Uh, and now if you look at this, this red moon rising thing, this is also an index or they're taking this and they're looking at the share of global high impact papers. So papers which have a huge impact in terms of citations, etc. So you could produce a lot of papers, but they may or may not have 
a huge impact. So they are looking only at papers now, not just high quality scientific papers. Like you could write a great article uh, and uh, but you could have a great paper, uh, but it may not get many citations. So papers which have very high degree of impact, uh, uh, in that also in 2022, China surpassed the US. So China is not just producing a large number of high quality research papers, but is also producing a bigger share of high impact papers. And that is very significant. Here you can see that the European Union is actually, you know, more or less stagnant, but in a better position today than it was 20 years ago. Whereas the US, I'm just embarrassed, irritated, and quite angry to see that even here there seems to be a steady decline. There seems to be a zero-sum game when it comes to scientific research. If China gains, the US goes down. So you can see a decline in the US and a rise in China. This graph shows the scientific disciplines where China is dominating. One thing I found very interesting is that China is investing more and more money in applied research. Uh, and as a result of that, they are more interested in innovations which are immediately uh, transferred to the industry and converted into financial profits. So there's a lot more research done on innovation, technology, and applied technology and applied sciences, and their focus is also quasi-military. So most of China's research is about, uh, which has military purposes. So if you look at the scientific disciplines, the red dot is China, the blue dot is European Union, and the pink dot is the US. So if you look at material sciences, chemistry, I'm surprised the University of Delaware is one of the best universities in the world for chemistry, we are number seven. But to see that the United States and Europe are so far behind uh, in material sciences, chemistry, engineering, computer science, environmental ecology, agriculture. So in all of this, including mathematics, China is investing more and is performing better than both Europe and the US. Uh, and the places where China is not performing as well is in biology, biochemistry, molecular. So in health-related uh, biological sciences, clinical medicine, immunology, etc., China is lagging far behind the U.S. Uh, and uh, Europe. So it's very interesting that in engineering fields, China is leading in investments, uh, clearly giving impact on on uh, uh, military uses, whereas the US and Europe are doing better than China. I don't think that Europe and the US are doing, I think Europe and US are doing what they do uh, in all fields. Uh, it's just that China is spending more in certain fields and not enough in other fields. They're leaving it to the West to do research in science and health while they are trying to invest more in sciences in, like engineering because uh, that is where the military competition is and that is where they could be deprived of. Uh, so, so for example, the US is not going to deprive China of some new medicine. If we come up with a cancer medicine, we will export it to China. We will not say we won't send it to you, but if we come up with a very advanced chip uh, which can help hypersonic missiles, we'll definitely not send that to China. <laughs> The key, there are two keys to all of this. Uh, and uh, and this is true always. Uh, number one is investments in research and research investments in great universities, creating them, and, and that cannot happen without money. So if you look at this particular graph from The Economist, they're saying very simply that there are three reasons why China has caught up with the US. It's money, money, money spending on university and government-based research. So if you look at the two graphs, you can see that China, and this is adjusted obviously for uh, purchasing power parity. So China is outspending the US uh, uh, in terms of uh, total research. But if you look at it, the US is, I mean, I like this, that it's fully balanced in terms of applied as well as pure research. So that means there's pure scientific research. Uh, we are also funding curiosity and not just military and other, uh, shall we say, commercial uh, research. Whereas China is also increasing its funding in 
pure sciences, but its major investment area is in applied sciences and applied technology. Uh, so, well, that is the attitude of a developing and rising challenger, you could say. The other one is rankings of universities. So you should all go and take a look at it. Look at the Leiden ranking. This ranking is the ranking of universities by the sheer volume of top quality research that they produce. Let me say that again. This is a ranking of universities' production of knowledge uh, and innovative knowledge and new knowledge creation. So basically, it's measured through how many high quality papers are you producing. So the number one university in the world is Harvard University. Everybody loves Harvard except the US government and Israel nowadays because there are all kinds of protests going on in Ivy League schools. But the Harvard University remains the number one university in the world in terms of producing high quality research. But that's not the interesting story. Of course, the surprise package is number five. Canada has, <laughs> Canada, the University of Toronto uh, has, uh, is number five in terms of scientific production. Uh, there's no Oxford or Cambridge in the top uh, <laughs> Uh, 20 also. So if you look at this research, what is remarkable and should jump out at you is look at number two, number three, number four, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10. So in the top 11 universities, Peking University, in, number, in the top 11 universities, uh, University of Toronto and Harvard, if you just take them out, two of those universities which are from G7 countries, you can see that nine out of the top 11 are Chinese universities. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if you look at the top 25 universities in the world in terms of production of scientific knowledge, uh, China has 16 universities. The United States has one, two, three, four, Five, only five in the top 25. China has 16. Oxford University is at number 23. And uh, South Korea has one. Uh, and Brazil has one. Oh, that's just so nice uh, that at least there's somebody from BRICS represented in the top 25 universities. India is nowhere. Uh, the highest rank Indian university when it comes to research production is IIT uh, Kharagpur, and it is ranked 274 on this list of scientific uh, research productions. Uh, so talking about money, if you look at this trend uh, from 1960 to 2020, so in 1960, the United States was spending 70%, 69% of all the money that went into research R&D worldwide. And that's why you can imagine the amount of power that the United States had in 1955. It was unbelievable how powerful the country was, including for a short time having monopoly on nuclear weapons. But the key to American power has always been scientific research, in my opinion. And you can see that it, it was backed by 69% of funding was done in the U.S., and the rest of the world combined, including the entire Soviet Union and everybody else was just 31%. So the US was spending more than double of what the rest of the world was spending on research. But look at 2020, it is reversed. The United States is spending 31% and the rest of the world is spending 69%. It is still remarkable because it doesn't mean that the United States is spending less. It just means the rest of the world is spending more. We are still what uh, the US is like five to 6% of the world's population, uh, but we are still spending one third of uh, the total amount of money that is spent on research. It's just that we don't have a dominant position, at least in research funding at the moment. These are the countries, the top 20 countries uh, based on the funding. This is UNESCO data, these two sheets that I'm talking about, the funding amounts. Uh, this is not from The Economist. So uh, the top 20 countries, the United States in just sheer number, uh, amount of money that it is spending is still the US. In 2020, it spent uh, $720 billion. I really like that number because it's more or less equal to the US defense budget. So the US is spending just as much on research and development as it is spending on 
on defense, so that would be around three and a half percent. China was second and is actually now uh, outspending the U.S. if you make adjustments for purchasing power. This is in 2020 data and after adjustment to uh, purchasing power parity. So China was second, Japan is third. So traditionally, it was U.S., Japan, and China after World War, uh, U.S., Japan, and Europe, which dominated science research, but now China has caught up, so is South Korea. So if you look at uh, the non-Western countries in the top 10 in terms of defense spending, it is China, uh, South Korea. Uh, South Korea is more or less a Western country now. So it's basically China and Russia. Uh, and there are two Asian countries, or three Asian countries, China, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, and then if you look at it, Canada, Spain, uh, the surprise thing to me was to see Turkey in the 13th spot. Uh, and uh, as you can see, India is not spending much on research and development at all. So last month, uh, Chinese sent a space a shuttle call. I don't know what it's called, Chang 6, or I don't know how they, how they pronounce it. It landed on the dark side of the moon and uh, actually ducks stuff out of a crater and is bringing stuff back. And so China is becoming a major power scientifically. And I think that is something that the world cannot afford to ignore. You can't just compete with China and how many ships do they have, how many planes do they have. I think the key is uh, to have a scientific advantage. Uh, so, so any country that is technologically ahead uh, will do much better uh, than a country that is not. So, for example, recently when Iran shot 300 rockets and missiles at Israel, none of them hit because Israel is technologically more advanced. Uh, and so Israel's defense, you can say it is indigenous or, from, or the U.S., whatever it was, the technology that was deployed for defense was far more superior to the technology that was employed in the offensive side of it. So technology is the key. And if you go back and read the history of warfare, you would know, you know, uh, I, I once read a paper about how crossbows made a huge difference in the battle, how armor made a view, then when gunpowder came, how cannons and guns and ultimately now nuclear weapons and space technology and hypersonic. So there is a connection, direct connection between scientific achievement and economic development and scientific achievement and military dominance. So, so that is why for those of you who are worried about the rise of China, well, here's another reason to be worried about. China's economy is growing uh, rapidly. It's become the second biggest economy expected to overtake the U.S. in less than two more decades. Uh, it is also now has the biggest Air Force and the biggest Navy in the world. And apparently now, it is also spending more on research and actually producing more on research. So I hope you found this conversation, well, I'm not going to say thoughtful, but worrisome and makes you think. So please subscribe to conversations, like this video, press the bell icon, and do share this video with your social political network, especially with students and professors and etc. Anybody who is remotely connected to a university should at least read this, and policymakers, of course. Policymakers is very important. Uh, to invest in research uh, at the university level, even at the school level, uh, develop a culture of scientific inquiry and curiosity that is very important. There are some societies and some swaths of nations where neither is scientific curiosity appreciated nor is it supported uh, financially and otherwise. Anyway, until next time, take care. I'm your host, Muftadar Khan. Thanks for watching Conversations.